Thank you. Please be seated. Good morning. We're here for oral argument in case number 1CACV19-0044, Julie Mazel v. Estate of William D. Layton. Just a couple of housekeeping matters to remind you that this oral argument is being video and audio recorded, so we ask you to please identify yourselves at the beginning of your arguments. Each of you will have 20 minutes, a maximum of 20 minutes, to present your arguments. And Ms. Mazel, if you would like to reserve any time for rebuttal, you'll need to watch the clock and save as much time as you would like. Also, please keep in mind that we've read the briefs. We've also conferenced the case. We're familiar with the basic facts and procedures of the case. With that, Ms. Mazel, you may proceed coming up to the podium. And please feel free to adjust the microphone so that we can hear you. Okay. Just before I start, clarification. If I wish to reserve, do you want me to tell you now? No. I can help you. How much time would you like to reserve? I'll probably talk about 15 minutes and then reserve some time. So if I need to have some time for rebuttal, I wish to add that. Thank you. Please proceed. Okay. My name is Julie Mazel, and I am the plaintiff, and I am a breast cancer survivor for over 15 years. And I wanted to start off to just say the background a little bit about my case is that... Counsel, can I interrupt you a second? I'd like you to be... We'd like you to focus on only facts that are actually in the record. Okay. Okay? Thanks. We can't consider anything new that you might add today. I'm sorry, what? We can't consider anything new that you might add today. Okay, thanks. Okay. The facts that I wanted to reiterate that I've already stated, that Dr. Zlayton's decision in my case to proceed with my procedure with the larger implant, the expert opinion not required for elements of malpractice in all circumstances, the Barrett and Harris 207 Arizona case, the fact that when I came for my also preoperative visit with Dr. Zlayton, I clearly indicated that I did not wish to increase the size, and that was also stated too in my case, is that I was very clear that I didn't want a larger implant when I came for my preoperative visit before my surgery on January 27th, and that I was addressing my rippling situation that I've had and I've always had throughout my... since I had my mastectomy. So the rippling issue was always something that I experienced all of my entire life since the mastectomy and with the implants. So Dr. Zlayton has taken care of me for over 10 years, so he's very familiar with my shape, body, size, and my whole situation case, because he's the one that took care of me for over 10 years. So nothing of my nature was out of the ordinary for him. It should not have been because I was under his care, and when he retired and then when he came back, and then when I started having the extreme rippling effects again, so because he was very familiar with my case, that that's why I went back to him to do the rippling. And then also with the new technology and specifically the gummy bear implant by Mentor. So I have always had the high-profile implant, which allows me to have the projection without having to increase the size. Let me go back to your comment about when you said the evidence showed that you said you did not want to increase the size. Correct. 
is were there notes to dr layton didn't he have notes that indicated that it was agreed that there would be a smaller a smaller implant or something around the 400 and 480 480 cc do you disagree with that with what his notes indicated no i don't where do you know that how how would those have been brought about in his notes or your honor do you disagree with that no i came in specifically asking to decrease my implants not to increase it and that i would i've always had the high profile implant so you were okay with the decrease just not an increase correct and in the documentation and in the last argue argument with the documentation dr layton dictated and had in his notes that i came for the office visit to decrease i never said that i wanted to increase okay so sorry um i lost my train of thought with the question well let me ask you a question then it it seems that your expert um i'm sorry this is the problem we were talking about with this microphone uh it seems that your expert um changed his mind uh somewhat between uh his his preliminary affidavit and his deposition and that's really i think what gave rise to the summary judgment in the superior court um if you could focus on that issue that would be helpful to us okay uh the expert witness um i know that he also submitted a supplemental um after the fact so i um wasn't aware that the deposition had a discrepancy until later on so to address it is that um below the standard of care um from the legal aspect of it is that um what i as stated before is that um regardless of dr schooler's affidavits provide the requisite expert opinion to comply with expert opinions statutes and to beat defendant's motion for summary judgment if defendant is focusing on procedural rules regarding the manner in which opinions provide provided the case law states that procedural rules should be interpreted to maximize a decision on the merits if there are inconsistency in the testimony that the jury can sort it out but for the motion for summary judgment all evidence and reasonable references should be reviewed in a light most favorable to my opposition to defendant's motion for summary judgment and so again i'm not an expert attorney i have no background in law my background is in health care and i understand full well as also being a patient of breast cancer for over 15 years and i went to nursing school and dr layton has i've been under his care for over 15 years so there would have not been anything irregular in me having a implant swap or just swapping an implant so i've never had an infection i've never had issues in my 15 years of again protocol is that even as a breast cancer implant the lifespan of the implant is like 10 years and so at that time i had the same implant for 10 years and then i was starting again to have the rippling so it was time to when i first saw dr sujimura who's taking care of me while dr layton was retired and not practicing the new implant the gummy bear implant came out and that was supposed to help patients like myself rippling is not abnormal for a breast cancer patient that is something it's not special just to me it's a huge issue that other breast cancer patients experience so the new mentor gummy bear implant was supposed to the way that it was built created and designed to just be more 
stabilize and position in the cavity so that it would decrease the rippling the only problem with that is that prior to me having the surgery i also asked the office manager do you have that implant so that i can see it to make sure that it's a like for like and it is like a round profile which i normally um, have had so i was told that they did not have an implant on site because it's also a new implant that they didn't have so that a patient can see which is normal uh, protocol she described to the implant that yes it is round and that it would be a match so when i came out of surgery the gummy implant I only have a torso of 13 inches, my chest walls. The implant is 16 inch wide. The size of the implant that he put in there, and I've looked, talked to um, other physicians, Dr. Kalnuki and then Dr. Uh, Schumann, and that other physicians can't fathom how he put that large of an implant in a 13 inch cavity but those opinions of those other physicians that's not part of the record is it no. you just um, have one expert correct i can't say 100 percent that the, that um all my um records were submitted when but there was, was no under- there was no sworn testimony from any no doctor, doctor. They, they were not brought in for sworn testimony but i know they that my medical records were su- all submitted from all of them. Okay. Um, now there are really two issues here, as, as yeah. I see it. I mean, one one issue relates to the scope of your consent, right? If you didn't consent to have the larger implant, then then that's an issue that we probably talk about in connection with your battery claim. The other issue is a medical negligence claim, where and that's where your uh, expert seemed to. Uh, <clears throat> change his, his mind and say, well, depending on what comes up at night, it, it's not outside the standard of care to um, do what he did. I mean, that's what he said in his deposition. That doesn't necessarily mean that uh, it's okay to do it without your consent, but it, it might mean that it doesn't fall below the standard of care that any doctor would have to have to comply with. At least that's how I think the trial court read that deposition testimony. So can you comment on the deposition testimony itself? I, I mean, to honestly answer you is like, again, I'm not an expert attorney, so I don't know the legal, the legal aspects of it. What I know from um, my experience too is that on the healthcare side, is that also it was also stated in Dr. Schooler and I stated in my last oral oral argument is that if a physician realizes that he ordered the incorrect implant and that Dr. Schooler also stated that at that point Dr. Layton should not have um, moved forward with my surgery. I mean he could have because if he ordered the incorrect and normally it isn't Dr. Layton that orders the implants. It would be somebody that is um, the office manager or somebody that orders an implants. And I've had um, other procedures where um, I am currently under care for with another physician and they order multiple, they have multiple implants on at hand and they call their reps and order multiple sizes. They just don't order one size because again, most physicians would know that once they go in, well, I'm under that when some, they could potentially come up with a situation that they didn't anticipate. I thought, I thought that's what the evidence showed happened here is at least in, I'm, I'm sorry. I, I thought that's what the evidence showed happened here, which is that at least, um, your expert uh, and uh, Dr. Layton thought that the circumstances observed during the operation required a change. Is, is right, but the thing is, is that this was also a brand new implant that was just brand new release, and physicians were did not have a lot of knowledge and expertise on it. And from my understanding, is that again, I'm reiterating the fact that they didn't even have the implant 
on site for me to review to see that if it was a like for like the office manager if whoever ordered the implants did they have the knowledge and expertise from their mentor rep did the physician was he fully dr layton was he well versed in this implant he'd never done a surgery with the new gummy bear implant so if i was the first or second or third which i don't know so i only go because dr layton passed away i only have his medical notes to go by and so i i can't speak to him so i'm sorry i know you wanted to reserve yeah five minutes but just a question i think in your opening brief if i understood correctly you acknowledge that there's um the preliminary affidavit that dr schooler offered and his deposition testimony that was contradictory as to causation and standard of care i think i think you acknowledge that in your opening brief did i understand you correctly as you began your your argument that there is the expert testimony is not required in a medical malpractice claim are you citing to a case saying that medical testimony is not required in my uh research again i apologize that i'm not i don't have an attorney did you cite to i thought you cited to a case the barrett versus harris 207 arizona 374 uh 12 86 p dot 3d 954 app dot 2 2004 in my research that i came up with if you'd like to reserve the rest of your time yeah yes you may thanks may it please the court my name is john egbert i represent the uh estate of dr layton and his professional corporation who are the defendants in this litigation um i think judge swan summed up with the two issues there's the battery consent issue and then there's the malpractice or negligence uh claims so let's start with a pure legal question then on the battery um the the trial court basically said there's no cognizable battery claim here by statute right i i i believe that the trial court looked at the consent form and found that there was consent okay i was under the impression that the trial court also applied the statute to find a legal bar against this this claim is that not right well i i don't believe so your honor and i know that the focus of our briefing in the answering brief was to rely on the language of the consent okay form fair enough would you would you contend that there is a legal impediment to a battery claim here we we are i mean the statute i believe has been held unconstitutional so we no we we are not asserting that the statute prevents uh the claim our argument and we i believe that the basis for the judge's decision was that in the consent form which she signed it expressly says authorizes dr layton to do additional procedures as he deems in his professional judgment to be necessary or desirable i think are the two uh is the standard that's stated there and and we believe that that is a consent how how broadly do you read that consent we we read it broadly enough to cover this situation and that is that as as ms misel indicated just a few minutes ago uh she acknowledged that this is a situation where once you're under anesthesia and you're in the middle of a surgery things can unanticipated and perhaps unanticipatable um factors can arise during the surgery and there needs to be some professional judgment that the surgeon can use and that's exactly not only what dr layton did he got in there and his notes reflect un undisputed uh evidence that the proposed the plan procedure wasn't going to solve the rippling problem which is why she was coming to him in the first place is there is there anything in his notes or anywhere in the record to indicate that the prospect of increasing the size was discussed i i'm not aware of 
any such thing in the summary judgment record. And what if, what about plaintiff's contention, allegation, assertion that she did, in no uncertain terms, did she agree to a larger implant, that she said, I do not want a larger implant? Why isn't that setting up a classic, well, let's let the trier of fact figure out who to believe here? Well, Your Honor, because I think we do have the consent form that is in writing. It's undisputed that that's her signature. She authorized Dr. Layton to say, I therefore, I recognize that during the course of the operation and medical treatment or anesthesia, unforeseen conditions may necessitate different procedures than those above. I therefore authorize the above physician to perform such other procedures that are in the exercise of his or her professional judgment necessary and desirable. Well, that sounds to me like life-saving stuff, not necessarily a change in the parameters of the intended procedure. But all of this, I mean, we can bat this back and forth all day. Why isn't that a dispute of fact? Because it is, I think that language that she signed preliminary to the surgery is undisputed. There is no dispute that she may have... There's no dispute that she signed that form. But what that form meant in the context of the consultations she was offered seems to be the subject of a live dispute to me. Well, I think we would disagree. I think that the evidence... I think you would too. But, Your Honor, in all seriousness, if you look at the language or the record that she relies on as her position, what she told and that there unquestionably was a desire to not increase. But I don't think there's a fair reading of the language to say that I forbade him under any circumstances to increase. Well, she didn't forbid him from amputating her leg either, but it's just not something that came up in discussion. Well, I think that in fairness, she came to solve a particular problem. This wasn't a situation where he's doing an implant swap and he amputates a leg. This is a situation where she comes specifically for the purpose, undisputedly, to solve a particular problem with her implants. Doctor gets in there and begins doing that and realizes, recognizes that the plan that they have isn't going to work, isn't going to solve the problem that she's come to him to solve. And she has consented to allow him to do the things that he thinks are necessary and desirable in his professional judgment. If you couple that then with her own expert's opinion that he would not say that increasing the size was, well, first of all, he testified that it was part of the surgeon's professional judgment. That's what surgeons have to decide. That's part of their judgment while they're in surgery is whether you go up or down. And he said it was not a below the standard of care for him to increase as he did. So you combine those things together, then I think it's undisputed. It should be undisputed that it fits within that language. This isn't a situation where he's going outside of his what's reasonable or necessary, desirable in order to give her what she came and is paying for him to do. But if he competently did something that she specifically didn't want done, even if it's medically appropriate, isn't that still a problem for a battery claim? Yeah, I think it could be, Your Honor, in some hypothetical circumstances. But I think under these circumstances where they have the discussion, here's our plan, here's what we want to do. I don't want to increase. In fact, I'd like to get smaller size implant. And then she signs this document that says, I'm giving you discretion. I want you to do, I want you to exercise professional judgment to do what you think is necessary and desirable. 
and we don't think that that can be an intentional tort of battery when somebody has sign language like that in this under these facts I don't know if the court has concerns about the other issue and I'm happy to address change in position yeah the the experts with respect to the negligence so our position there is that this is this is very clearly a situation where the her own expert gives testimony that support summary judgment at his deposition and that's what the court relied on essentially her arguments have been that but there's a preliminary affidavit before he gave his deposition I think that is that is handled very succinctly with the Supreme Court's language from form school about summary judgments and they say they make it very clear that it's not any dispute of fact that will prevent a motion for summary judgment it's only disputed facts that are genuine disputed facts and one of the examples of disputes that could create a scintilla of doubt or you know some of these sense rejected standards for summary judgment that the court pointed to was affidavits so if somebody gives an affidavit and then contradicts themselves in a deposition that's not a genuine issue of material fact yet if somebody if somebody gives an affidavit and then contradicts themselves at trial I'm not sure if you can hear me but if somebody gives an affidavit and then contradicts themselves at trial we don't grant judgment as a matter of law we leave that as a credibility determination for the jury yeah and and here when you have a situation where it's in a deposition context where there's abilities to for the opposing counsel to say hey what about your prior you know declaration why why is this why are you being inconsistent or did you really mean to say that all of that was possible and even after the fact there's an opportunity to correct the deposition all of which that still amazes me but yes that is part of our rules yep and so I don't think that it creates for and I'm not really talking yet about the the sham affidavit rule although this is kind of a close cousin to that I think and indeed some cases and other jurisdictions have called this situation also a sham affidavit rule context but whether you call it that or not the whole purpose of of this concept is to make sure that we're not undercutting or undermining summary judgment procedures and making them of no effect no I understand that let's let's talk about the the laws apparent fear of nuance then I suppose from an advocative standpoint this expert didn't do a great job but it is possible that the expert was actually just trying to tell the truth in both instances and the truth can sometimes be complicated as little as we like to acknowledge that these days can you point to a direct 180 degree conflict between the deposition I mean clearly the deposition took a different tone and made some admissions that were not present in the affidavit but can you point to a specific opinion in the affidavit that was directly contradicted in deposition yes okay I think all three both with respect to the size with respect to the infection and with respect to the causation issue of the infection all three of them there's a direct contradiction and I would point out to that Ms. Mizell has not contract not argued otherwise so there's there's really no dispute between the parties here in front of you that there's a contradiction and so I think for example where he says in his deposition quote I wouldn't say it's below standard of care that part of the case was below standard of care no that's pretty pretty direct testimony that increasing the size of the implants was not below the standard of care then of course in his subsequent affidavit he says just the opposite it was below standard of care shouldn't have done it 
that's number one number two the treatment of the infection he said under cross examination i guess it's reasonable to try and quote to keep the implants despite the infection quote as long as they're not showing other signs of sepsis or some other harmful medical conditions so he says it's okay to it's okay i guess it's okay he says i would have questioned it i mean he had he had concerns about it no question and he expressed those in his deposition but when it came right down to it he says i guess it would be reasonable to try if she really wanted it to be kept in as long as there wasn't some severe infection like sepsis in his affidavit later he says no that fell below the standard and then in his deposition with respect to causation which would be another reason to to deal a blow to the infection argument he said in his deposition quote the bottom line is i can't say that the outcome would have been any different had the implant simply been removed in february and those are pretty directly inconsistent and ms my zell doesn't argue otherwise although if removing the if removing the implant was an option doesn't that cut two ways number one it bolsters your defense on the malpractice claim but doesn't it tarnish your defense on the battery claim no the removal was once the the infection developed post-surgery so we're talking about i apologize you're right several weeks later or yeah it was some some period of time later it wasn't during surgery that that this option of just simply removing them the issue was the argument that the expert in his original affidavit said was once that infection you know came up you shouldn't have waited that long before you simply remove the implants and that was below the standard of care in his deposition he says i can't say it was below the standard of care if she really wanted it and then then he doubles down on that by saying i can't i can't tell you the bottom line is i can't tell you the outcome would have been any differently even if you had removed it immediately when the infection developed so that's a separate issue your honor um fair enough thanks so counsel can you go back to something you've already touched on i'm just trying to wrap my head around the the 14 page consent form that was signed doesn't that really go to miss mizell's lack of informed consent claim more than it does her claim of battery meaning i the uh when when dr spiegel talks about being within the standard of care to walk around 1500 cc's per day you don't need expert testimony on battery do you you don't but but you what you were asking me about was doesn't it go toward more of the informed consent and in the duncan case the court the supreme court makes it very clear that if you're talking about informed consent you're now leaving battery and you're moving into the negligence realm where you would need expert testimony and the expert her expert already testified that it's not below the standard of care to increase the the size but your position is that the 14 page consent form that she signed authorized the scope of the procedure to go up an additional 75 cc above the implant she already had that's your argument is that what you're hearing right well it it's kind of my argument my argument is that this um consent form allowed him to use his professional judgment to uh do different different from what they had discussed and agreed upon allowed him to exercise his professional judgment so it takes care of the intentional battery situation and it clearly can't there can't be an argument that it was not he you know he wasn't exercising professional judgment he was going off the reservation or you know whatever he was doing something inappropriate because their own expert said no that's within his professional judgment so that's that's how i bring in the experts to this consent form 
just so that you know it's clear that this isn't something so far afield like coming in to do an implant swap and ending up using his professional judgment to amputate a leg. But no matter how broad that language is or how ambiguous, don't we have to be concerned with what a patient's actual expectations are from consultation with the doctor? I mean, you might sign one of these forms that has all this sort of broad language in it, but if the doctor tells you, and I'm not saying that there's clear record evidence for this, but if a doctor tells you, we're going to do these procedures, we're not going to do procedure X, and then winds up doing procedure X and says, well, I had latitude, I had professional judgment, doesn't the express understanding of the patient factor into the issue of consent? Well, I think there what you're really getting into, Your Honor, is our normal and somewhat difficult to apply rules of construction, right? This is a contract, and, you know, is it clear on its face? Well, I guess I'm, okay, let's shift into the commercial world. Let's talk parole evidence. Wouldn't Taylor allow in parole evidence of the patient's actual understanding before we arrive at an interpretation? Well, I think in some hypothetical situations it might, but I don't think under the circumstances, under the narrow set of facts that we have in front of us in this motion for summary judgment, I don't think there's evidence that would support that kind of bringing in, you know, expectations that contradict the clear and unambiguous language of the agreement. So I would disagree with that. Any other questions? All right. Thank you. Thank you, counsel. Ms. Mizell, would you like to say anything in rebuttal? I'd like to address some of the things that the defendant said, is that I have objected to the things that he brought up, especially the lack of informed consent, and I wrote this up. So as for any claim of lack of informed consent and assault and battery, defendant claims that my signing an informed consent form relieves him from liability. The fact that the form states, 42 of deposition SOP, that I understand that there may be alternative treatments and that treatments have risk does not support his claim that he gave me correct advice and proper disclosures authorizing him to make the conscious decision during the middle of my surgery. When I am unconscious under a general anesthesia to insert an oversized implant, the fact that the form 46 of defendant SOF allows the doctor to perform procedures that he deems necessary and desirable also does not address my claim. His procedures were neither necessary nor desirable for my care. I had personal consultations with him expressing my expectations. See, for instance, page 116 to 70 of my deposition that describes my instructions to him. His failure in complying with our understanding of the parameters and results that we crafted cannot be overridden from a form document that attempts to release him of his negligence. Yes, I did object to it. The thing is, is that, yes, I did sign the consent. I always sign a consent for surgery. That's protocol. But it doesn't alleviate the fact that I did specifically before surgery specify my parameters, and I clearly stated that. And also, to clear up some other stuff, the mentor implant, the gummy bear versus the size, the gummy bear is also like a brick. I don't have a prop or anything to do it. I currently have a high-profile implant now, and my current surgeon reduced my size, and I have the implant that was best fit for my body frame and my health. So the gummy bear implant was also, when you increase the size, it wasn't doing the profile projection. The size of the implant, because it was a new implant, went left to right width-wise. If you increase the size, it also increased the width and the cavity. 
So it wasn't a implant that was high profile, which gave a projection which would be needed for a breast cancer patient because we no longer have the fat, which gives the projection. It would be closer to the chest walls and more flat. So not only is the size important, but also the type of implant. I've always had, again, reiterated, I always had a round high profile implant. The type of implant that Dr. Layton decided to, um, not decided, that we decided to, um, was heavier, thicker, and it was a teardrop. It was- Did your expert discuss the type of implant? Did your not that I am aware of. Okay. So the, I know that um, I'm just sticking to the facts, and so I know it wasn't in there, but as from the, the healthcare and understanding the implant and what's going into my body, um, again, Dr. Schooler stated that once Dr. Layton got into surgery and he discovered that it was not the right type of implant or the right size, that he should not have proceeded. He could have canceled it and said, you know, we can like reschedule for another day and let's revisit and talk about it. So in my opinion is that the poor judgment of Dr. Layton, he would never, uh, the poor judgment that he chose. Um, again, I, I don't know how he would have gotten that size of an implant into a 13 inch cavity. I'm only five foot one and my torso is only 13 inches. The implant was bigger than my whole right side. So, um, and again, I currently have the high profile implant in me. Okay, thank you, Ms. Menzel, counsel. Uh, the court will take this matter under advisement. We thank you for your, for your comments, your arguments this morning. We'll take it under advisement and issue a decision in due course. We'll take a brief recess to uh, I'll set up for the next argument. Thank you.